Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess most of us are settled, so we'll, we'll proceed. So, um, hi, my name is Rahul, and uh, it's my colleague Aman, and uh, we work with uh, Cisco on their service provider uh, solutions. And uh, there are two more people who contributed to this, but um, unfortunately, they're not here today. Like, uh, so. Uh, so basically, we have a, a solution which does a lot of things in the back end with the switches and uh, does the configuration and gets some services on. But um, what we're going to talk here today is the whole um, bunch of back end services that we built. And uh, they run, or, I mean, they run on any cloud. So OpenStack is one of the supported ones. So um, we started with a lot of iterations, and we learned a lot of things. Uh, we tried. To, we wanted to uh, design our uh, um, backend services in a cloud native way. And uh, over the time, we did a lot of things wrong. We did. Uh, we had multiple iterations. We used uh, virtual, you know, virtual machines where we used to deploy the. Uh, microservices that were there, and then we moved to the container model. So a lot of learnings in the process, and um, so we would be discussing some of the entire patterns and the uh, design patterns that uh, we learned out of it. So I'm sure most of you would have gone through a lot of them, and uh, the ones that we could relate to our work, we were going to discuss uh, most of the, that content. And uh, to start with, I'm sure um, we should have a homogeneous, uh, I mean, a heterogeneous crowd where people would, some of the people would be new uh, to cloud native. So just a couple of slides and people who uh, are, have been working, uh, I mean, just bear with us. So first of all, you know, what is cloud native application and why are we doing it? Why do we hear it so much? Why is the market attracted to it so much? So. Cloud native is uh, basically a software design architecture pattern where you know the applications uh, are designed to run and they're made to run in a way where they can reap the maximum benefit of what the cloud would provide. I've, I've tried to list a couple of points uh, below, uh, like you know being distributed, scalable, multi-tenant, and uh, platform independence. So uh, as um, if your design inherits these uh, these uh, you know things it would be um, that would I, personally i would call that as a cloud native application and uh, so it's different from uh, a cloud enabled or a traditional monolith application so uh, how is it different so the internal components of uh, the system can scale well and are inherently distributed um, it is lightweight, and uh, I mean, with the usage of virtual machines, containers, and different kind of you know advanced deployments, uh, they try to make the deployment lightweight. And uh, uh, you know, DevOps and continuous integration-based deployment, so that whatever you write reaches the production quickly. So monolithic versus cloud native. So uh, there, there's so many things that change. So why why are we actually moving towards cloud native? So that is because we can easily achieve scale resilience and uh, like upgrades and so many things uh, seamlessly. So uh, let's just take an example of a monolithic application under load. Uh, so you have a application which has so many components and they're very tightly coupled and uh, you have uh, you know like a monolith and under regular load you, you would have something like this and as soon as you increase the load, one of your components gets stressed. The, now, this is the only way to uh, actually scale up. So you have to replicate the entire stack and probably put it behind a load balancer, and uh, which, which we know is not the most optimized way of doing it, because it's just that one component which is getting stressed and not all of them. Why do we have to replicate the entire stack? So. Uh, this is what you would be doing in a monolithic uh, application under load, and you would distribute the load, and then things work fine and uh, come back to normal. So uh, instead, the new cloud native application approach, you would all these blocks that you see would be like a microservice, 
Uh, we'll come down to people who would have a question, you know, do we only need a microservice to be cloud native? So we'll come down to that, but uh, I mean, we know it's a well-known approach, so uh, these, these cubes over here are uh, your microservices and uh, co basically components of your application. And as soon uh, as you increase the load and you stress the system, something something like maybe your auth component authorization that's that's get uh, beaten up really bad right we have seen that everywhere so uh, maybe you want to replicate that put it load behind a load balancer connected uh, to the you know messaging system and then you have things up proper now so Everything that we have, I mean, going back, I, I talked about resiliency, I talked about scale, I talked about, you know, if you, tomorrow you want to change uh, implementation of just one microservice, you can do it very easily in a, in a tightly coupled system like uh, monolithic, it is very, very difficult and uh, not so easy. I mean, then again, uh, monolithic applications are of wide category and uh, it depends on how you, how you designed them, how well you designed them. Uh, here you have a structured approach and changing things, uh, they're, they're small. The changing things become very, very simple. So uh, every technology that gets so much traction has, has the uh, enterprise and people, you know, it makes a business impact while everyone's looking behind it. So let's see what business impact cloud native applications give you. Um, they give you all the cloud advantages that we discussed in, uh, previously right now. So uh, apart from that, uh, it's very flexible. So most of them are designed in a way where you can just migrate your load uh, across any of the cloud providers. So none of the companies like to be really tied with uh, a specific uh, hardware or a platform. So they want the independence that at the end of the day, we want to run appli applications, right? That's, that's the goal. We want to run the software. And we don't want it to be very tightly coupled with the um, underlying hardware or underlying platform or an underlying IS, any of it. So uh, this fits in the model very well. And it's collaborative and agile, as we discussed, uh, DevOps and CI is uh, part of it. So the, the, the time taken between you writing the code and that reaching the production uh, after testing is, is short. So uh, the business like it. Uh, I mean, they don't have to wait for a full cycle before that goes to your customer. Uh, based upon certain guidelines, so as I said, um, there are so many guidelines uh, available today, like uh, a common one called 12-factor app. So if you follow them, uh, um, there's a homogeneous kind of uh, design, and uh, it's easy to pick up, and you know how, uh, I mean, it, it takes people a shorter bootstrap time to get onto the, uh, to this kind of system. Re-implement, replace, upgrade, as we discussed, become very, very simple. Uh, resource optimized and resilient. So, uh, I mean, most of the contain, um, most of the microservices are moving towards the container approach because of our obvious advantages, and uh, that gives you, you know, high density virtualization and it can be easily clustered to provide uh, recovery in case of failures. So, okay, so getting uh, into the technical stuff a bit. Um, so, I mean, uh, if you ask, I would uh, try to design a, a cloud native, uh, this would be a basic primary cloud native architecture uh, that we would have. We would have a um, you know, couple of microservices that could be um, your business logic. Uh, you, you need to have uh, you know, log aggregation there because uh, these are so many distributed systems running, uh, applications running on so many nodes and so many instances. So you need an aggregator where you can actually uh, debug things when they go wrong. API gateway for uh, routing your requests internally. Uh, and uh, health and monitoring because uh, then again uh, these challenges come along with the distributed system uh, where you it's very difficult to monitor so many systems all together you need a system that could tell you the health and probably even take care of uh, small situations uh, discovery service uh, will dwell more upon that as we go for, uh, forward and backing resources when I mean uh, I mean when I say backing resources we say anything that gets uh, uh, connected over the network like uh, a database, a Cassandra, so that. And then uh, you see, interestingly, we have a REST API on the top and uh, messaging queue at the bottom. So 
why do we have this? So uh, this, these are the two, um, two systems that we use extensively for uh, communication. So any, uh, you know, uh, the rest is uh, natively uh, synchronous. So uh, any kind of synchronous um, request would be, and, and all the public a facing APIs would be usually rest. And uh, uh, anything that you want to do, like mostly uh, your microservices talking internally or uh, anywhere where you need uh, a, a, a synchronous environment, you would use the message queue. So uh, going forward, uh, I mean, let's let's just discuss a point which we discussed earlier. So, uh, do we really need to be like a microservice always to be cloud native? No, not really. You can design a monolith to be cloud native as well, but then it it is a big challenge. And uh, you know, um, it, it, as long as it, it it gives you all the advantages, as long as it scales well, as long as you can change things, as long as it is portable, it, it is cloud native. So. So, but then uh, there are some gu guidelines which make your life easy. We don't, I mean, uh, it depends on people. If you want to go to the market quickly, there are some set guidelines. If we can follow them and go to the market quickly, or, or definitely there's another way where we, you sit with the microlith and try to design better. I mean, but um, for the discussion here today, we can have, uh, we, we're just laying out a couple of points that we felt. Uh, helped us go cloud native fast. So one being the DevOps. So what is DevOps? So uh, DevOps is the collaboration between Dev and Ops, and uh, it's not just tools; it's uh, process and culture as well. So um, some of the tools that you, you you would be using would be your Ansible, um, Puppet Chef. Then uh, their CI CI uh, would help make sure that uh, your the code that you write reaches uh, the production. Uh, in a very short time and is tested well. Uh, third is the containers. Uh, I mean, you, you can we can always have virtual machines or any other infra infrastructure um, service as well. But containers, as we see, are uh, with with the evolution of Docker and the toolkit that comes along with it. Uh, Docker, Rocket, the, these have uh, become. Uh, much better for the application developers to write their applications on top of that. And um, the, with the low footprint, it, it really solves the purpose that the virtual machines were solving very well. So uh, we see that uh, you know, using containers gives you a definite advantage. Um, then is the fourth uh, thing, which is uh, your, your core logic, which you would put as microservices. Uh, so basically, all uh, all the other three that we discussed earlier were part of process or infrastructure, and you choose uh, one out of the many available options. And uh, microservice is the uh, basically th that area where you can actually innovate and you can follow. This would be something that you would be designing. So um, th this is uh, v where we would take. Um, I mean, a deep dive, and uh, Aman would be going through a couple of uh, anti-patterns and design patterns, which we saw worked good for us in our product. And uh, um, I mean, uh, then again, there are so many. There, there are hundreds of design patterns, but these are some of the patterns that really helped us um, do our stuff well. So, Thanks, Rahul. Yeah, so the first thing is the 12-factor app. So to design a microservice ar architecture, there are some set of guidelines. These are the best practices that we can follow to design a microservice ar architecture. So there are 12 factors. It's available on our 12factor.net uh, website. I'm not going to discuss all of them, but let's, let's see a few of them. So the first is the code base. So the 12factor app says that there should be a version control system being used in designing a microservice architecture like Git or Supervision ATC. So the idea is traditionally, Monolithic application also had uh, uh, version control system like Git or something. But the problem there was, for each and every component, there were different code bases. But with 12-factor app, the entire application will have a single code base, but the deployment can be multiple. A single code base can be used to deploy a development environment, or a staging environment, or a production environment. So this is the idea behind code base. Uh, I'll go about uh, build, release, run. So, the build cycle says that the code can be bundled into executable. Then there is a release cycle, which can put the current deployment config. 
and then there is a run cycle, which can actually go ahead and deploy a different kind of environment based on, uh, like the environment can be different. As I said, it can be a production or it can be a staging or development, ETC, because all the environments are almost the same. Third, I would discuss a very important uh, point is a dev prod parity. So what used to happen in monolithic applications is that there were differences between a development environment and actual production environment. So developers were using a lightweight database access while the production cannot use that. So with the 12 factor uh, guidelines, you have to keep the same development environment as you have a production environment. You can use the DevOps thing where, uh, uh, where there is a collaboration between the development and operations and uh, the basically the difference between the development and production should be as minimum as possible. Yeah. So uh, you can read about that. Any question we'll uh, discuss after the, because I don't have that, many, that much time. Next, we'll discuss about some of the design patterns of microservices. So these are not all design patterns that we are going to discuss. There are a lot many on the web. But what we are going to discuss is the design patterns that we saw in our cloud native application when we were working on that. Uh, we we uh, found out some anti-patterns as well as some uh, design patterns as well. I'll start with them. So the first one that we have identified is a fragmentation pattern. So it says fragment as you scale and, frag and the advantages that fragmentation gives. So what happens? Whenever we see that there is a cloud native application, we talk, ad talk about cloud native, we start designing in a microservice based architecture. But not all components are worthy of being an independent microservice. It takes resources. It's difficult to manage. It's not that easy to manage. If you have multiple pebbles in there. You have to manage each and every one. Yeah, so, yeah. More microservices means more stress on your network. Yeah. But I mean, traditionally, when you um, start thinking, you start thinking, you know, uh, okay, I got so many business units, I need, um, and I have uh, these business functions. So let me start putting all of them in a separate microservice, and then I have logging this, that. So when uh, when you start, you have like 20, 25 microservices, and then as you scale, you find that, okay, this is a concern, I need to split this, and then you know it's just basically a sprawl, and after that, you it just becomes management becomes difficult. So yeah. So the best way to start with a monolithic approach, I, I'm not saying to write a monolithic application, but our approach should be monolithic, where we need to identify what all services are worthy of extracting as a different microservice. So let's see with example. So there are four components in an application, and there are, so uh, going forward, we identified that the component two is the one which can be stressed out. So the, so the idea is to take out component two from the application, and scale it independently. So this component two can be a, the first microservice in your application. So this is what fragmentation pattern is. Next is a resource adapter pattern. So most of the time we identified that the service has a public endpoint. So what happens in this, that case, anyone outside of your, outside the application can access, can directly access the service. This is a major security concern as any malicious user can get access to the service. So here comes a resource adapter pattern where you're not exposing the public endpoint of the service directly to the client. Instead, you'll be ha having an adapter service in between the request and the service. The public endpoint will be shifted to the adapter service and the actual uh, business logic service will have an internal endpoint. The benefit is that the adapter service can validate the request coming in and only the legitimate request can be forwarded to the internal one and rest of the, them can be denied. It actually, it also does some sanity test where uh, the adapter, where some request which should not go to the service uh, logic is handled by the adapter service itself. Yeah. Yeah. Next is uh, anti-conf pattern. So how we all started uh, learning coding in, uh, when we were kids, we started uh, with hard coding everything in a file, then then we moved ahead, we started using variables, we started using stacked up variables, and then those variables were used in the files. Similarly, with the software development process, in the very old days, we were using uh, constant files. Those constant files were part of our uh, code base itself. These files were used to, these files had all the hard-coded IP ports and everything were there, and uh, other files were leveraging uh, the constant file to know more information about that. Then we moved to confile approach. So where everything was written in a ETC con file kind of a thing. So with this approach also, since we are 
currently in a distributed, widely scaled uh, uh, environment. The, the problem is we, we, we cannot handle everything with a con file because there are so many changes everywhere. It's, it's widely distributed. Yeah, the system's so dynamic. You, you uh, in a cloud native, uh, let's say you are auto scaling, you are uh, bringing up services on, on demand, and uh, then how, how do you go and uh, configure the uh, con files? And so this was a problem when we started going to the cloud native approach, and hence we had to get away with that and put as much things in the environment variables, and you read, uh, so I guess yeah. you, you can. So the solution to this problem is to couple two things. First is the use of uh, environment variables. So everything would be, most of the thing would be running as a runtime environment variable. So let's see with an example. So here I have two services, service A and service B. Let's say we service A wants to talk to service B. It doesn't know how to reach service B. So one possible thing is it can have an environment variable where service B IP and ports are exposed. The other thing is there is a, a central discovery service called console or something, which is a distributed lookup service which contains information about IP port and some other metadata as well. So service, so this console information can be exposed as an environment variable and service A can query the console cluster to lo know the service B location. Console cl cluster can reply back with the IP port and what other metadata it needs then directly service A talks to service B. So this is the cloud native approach for uh, between uh, services. Next is a circuit bre breaker pattern. So most of us have used a retry kind of a pattern where in a client server model, whenever we are trying to send a request and there is no response back, we try to send the request again after a certain timeout. But let's think about a scenario when every time you are sending a request after a certain timeout but you're not getting the response back. So there, there's a problem. How do we solve that? So there is a circuit breaker pattern to, for that. It says, do not try if the request is failing continuously. So let's see how, how does this work. So it also uses a central discovery system. So let's say uh, service A is trying to send a request to service B, but the response is not coming back. It does some retry, it tries to send the same request after a certain timeout, but the request is not coming back. So what service A does, it notifies a central uh, discovery service that B is down. Now if any other service, let's say C is trying to uh, talk to service B, it will first query the central discovery service if uh, service B is up or not. It will get a reply that B is down, wait. Now the pattern, this is the pattern. Now to recover from this situation, you can have multiple approach. You can either scale service B or you can replace or whatever. That, that, that depends on you. But the pattern says in such kind of a scenario, your request should not fail. If some component, component is not working, the other application should be working seamlessly, but the, the application should not, the yeah. application should keep working. Yeah, so basically you go to the plan B, and if you want to show the service unavailable, or you want to show, you know that uh, a previous version of the service works, and then you can bring up that and uh, let it serve the request for some time. So there's so many approaches uh, for, for the firefighting, but, uh, uh, I mean, this, uh, that is after this. So this is like an advanced uh, retry pattern. That, yeah, right. Thanks, Rahul. So the next thing is a cor log correlation and aggregation pattern, I would say. So what happens? In a microservice, in, traditionally what used to happen? So uh, my app was uh, deployed on a single uh, machine. So to manage the logs, it was easy. It was re relatively easy. Now with the uh, use of microservices, we have distributed microservices and a client request can come to the first microservice and then it can, the, the life cycle of the request can go to different microservice and all. So similarly, there can be multiple service requests coming from the client side and each and every microservice will generate their own logs. Now if we want to debug a certain service request, how do we do that? It's very difficult because we have so much of microservice, so much of logs generated out of microservices. So what this pattern says, you tag an incoming service request with a correlation ID, and throughout the life cycle of that service request, in between any microservice, whatever the request goes, the same uh, correlation ID will be carried, and the logs which are generated from uh, microservices will also carry the same correlation ID. Uh, it can be coupled with a log aggregation pattern as well, where a log aggregator can pick up logs from different microservice and project it at a single repository. Yeah. So uh, 
Now, these, these five were some anti-patterns that we see that, that they are not, normally they, these kind of patterns are implemented. Now we'll move to some regular patterns. So uh, this is the first pattern. This is uh, in, uh, related to design and scalability. So this is a leader election pattern. So multiple instances of same microservice should always elect a leader. So what happens? Multiple instances are there. They are sharing a same resource. So there, there, there is need of someone which can coordinate this resource sharing process. So there, this leader election patterns comes in. So out of these three instances, one will be selected as the leader. So the leader election can happen based on the lowest instance ID, lowest process ID, or there are multiple uh, algorithms for that. So one important thing, it is important for all the instances to keep polling the leader, because any time the leader goes off, this system goes off. So in this case, our, I, I, so either the non-leader instances keep polling the leader, or there can be uh, approach of a leader and as a sub-leader as well. Next is a queue-based messaging pattern. So this is related to the availability. So it says instead of sending the request directly to a service, use messaging queues. So what happens? A client is sending request to the uh, server. There is a microservice which takes a request. So in such kind of a scenario, the client request is low for some time. The request is very low. But suddenly it spikes up. Now, definitely the service can scale, the microservice can scale, but that particular spiked up request is not handled properly. So, the, so in this case, we use a message queue, where at the input of the message queue, even if, if it, the request is spiked up, the output of the message queue is always flat. It may be high, the flat, the flat thing may be high or it may be low, but it's always flat. One problem with this approach is that it cannot be used at a point where we need the response to come as soon as possible. Because uh, this is, yeah, it's, it's asynchronous. It's, it's, it's uh, in a queue. So if the request is, so if there are some, some other requests to be served, it will, it will be served first. So this is one problem with this uh, approach. But most of the places, it works fine. The next is query and update segregation pattern. So this is related to data management. So it says that the database schema for read and write operation should always be different. So what happens? We have a same schema that for a read and write model. Let's suppose that we have a same schema for read and write operation. So the same uh, data transfer object will be queried from the service. So this causes a mismatch sometimes, because sometimes you are writing something, you are doing a write operation, you are adding some columns. But the read operation is not able to read the added columns. And also, it can cause contention issues where the resource is locked for writing and you are trying to do a read operation. So to solve such kind of uh, problems, we use uh, this pattern, where the, the read and write model are different. And that way, the read DTO and the write DTO are also different. Uh, depends on the number of requests. Uh, so the, the thing is, the read model should always be a mirror of the write model, because essentially, the thing is the same. Now, uh, depending on the request, it can be scaled. Like we have multiple databases, multiple instances of databases for read and write, but the model itself is different. OK, so this is the final part of our presentation. I'll let Rahul speak yeah. about this. So uh, then again, uh, we come to a point where we uh, thank someone. He, he actually took uh, you through all the um, design patterns that we identified that were very important with our uh, development, and I hope it helps you guys as well uh, at some point in time. And uh, so uh, another important thing is how do we split uh, the microservices? Because this is a very basic use case uh, when you're developing with the microservices. Uh, you might have a cloud uh, monolithic application and you want to migrate it to uh, a cloud native scenario and maybe other use cases. Let's just go ahead and discuss this. So these are the th three basic use cases which I could immediately come up with. So it's like a needed uh, when, when we are trying to transition a legacy monolith application to a cloud native. Uh, we're trying to split a microservice if it is needed structurally or functionally. Or we're trying to split uh, a microservice when uh, I mean, which, which has uh, components which might be bottleneck at scale. So, how do we identify that? You know, where do we actually start? Uh, how do we split? So, we we all know that uh, 
Database is one of the concerns, but let's just start with this. So do not uh, compose the entire application at once. This is sometimes the most common mistake that we do. We take the application and we say, you know, these are the different uh, logics and let's just disintegrate it into so many parts and uh, try to sew them up as microservices. Well, that doesn't quite work very well. So it should be always uh, like a chip. So uh, you start shipping the monolith, and at the end of the day, you can segregate it into many microservices. So uh, another approach is, um, let's say, you how you know start with building a new my feature as a microservice. So you, if you get a new feature, you start with that as a microservice and build a adapter around your monolith so that it can talk to the legacy. Uh, your new microservice can talk to the legacy monolith. And uh, uh, identify the areas that would need change in immediate time frame and pick them up for splitting. Um, and then again, identify areas uh, which would, uh, which, which upon changing would not impact other areas. So these areas are called seams uh, in a in a monolith, where uh, if you change that part of the code, that would not impact the rest of the application. So this is how we need to identify the split areas. And uh, there's certain approaches that we take while splitting. So uh, database is the most tightly coupled part of uh, most of the monoliths that we've seen. So uh, the schema, uh, we start. We really need to start looking at the schema. And uh, when we look at the schema, the foreign key constraints are the major deterrents um, to start with. So uh, how do you actually go ahead and uh, take away the foreign key constraints? So you have to expose an API so that you can get those values uh, for, for the new Microsoft when, when you're trying to split it. Yes, there are some of the uh, problems that come along with it, uh, like let's say data inconsistency. Uh, let's say one of your tables has a, a value missing. So these are logics you need to build as you go. And uh, because it would be very um, case specific. And uh, splitting components that share common data. So let's say um, you're accessing a database and two of your uh, components are accessing the same data. It could be a static data or something. So you uh, have to make sure that uh, you split that in a separate microservice and just get a getter setter kind of a microservice which just serves data. Uh, then uh, the most simple would be like if you have uh, uh, columns uh, in the table and the logic in the code which can be mapped uh, and separated. Uh, there might be several replications as part of this, but uh, then again, uh, it's for the greater good. Uh, and another last uh, but not least, the important part would be that you have to handle this in a proper transaction and rollback based model. Because initially, when you had a monolith, and uh, if some part errored out, you would know it very well because it's all contained inside an application. But uh, when when you have a distributed cloud native application with so many microservices, let's say your requests get served by three microservices, and then you have an error in the fourth, you need to make sure the sanity of the system remains after your you you know roll back. So this is an important aspect when you are actually migrating from a traditional system monolith to a, um, a, a microservice-based uh, cloud-native application. So yeah, so that would conclude most of the part that we wanted to cover. We would be open for question and answers till we have time. I, I guess we should still have some time. Yeah, we, we have. Uh, my name is Michael McHugh, and I work for Red Hat. And um, so you were talking about injecting information into your uh, into your applications using like a configuration file or using environment variables. Um, a lot of times, the problems we run into are injecting like sensitive information into into these applications, like credentials to access cloud resources. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your thoughts about like you know you don't want to use an environment variable or a configuration file in these cases. You know what do you, what do you guys do to solve those problems? Uh, I mean, uh, to, for us, uh, while we were developing, uh, so you can use something like uh, maybe Vault or uh, secure uh, things to to get a token and uh, 
but I mean, I might not have the best answer right now, but uh, we can definitely connect on, on, on this. Yeah, that's one valid point. In, in our dev environment, it's always, uh, you know, you, you, it's easy. But for a production environment, that's really a concern. I think uh, we do use Vault for, for that, but I don't know whether th that would serve this purpose or not. I mean, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I I had a question around um, compatibility of your microservices. Yeah, sure. Um, how do you how do you manage it if business requirements are for say say moving in a direction that would require a change across multi microservices to implement a particular feature? Is this something where you have to do artificial things to make sure that you're always being compatible, or is there a straightforward way to manage those kind of changes across multiple services? I think uh, most of this would be taken uh, part as part of CI as well, and uh, when when I mean you start making changes to various uh, microservices, and then you have to you know while you're integrating, you have to make sure things roll out well, and you can do it in a phased manner, that wherein uh, you make some changes in in uh, in one of the microservices, and still you have the API compatibility and. Then you deploy the next one and slowly move over to that. So, if I understand your question correct, uh, that's what I would be doing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Great presentation, by the way. Uh, so, two part. I have two questions. One is uh, around microservices. How do you uh, maintain the relationship? between uh, across microservices? So, from business perspective, you have a and, and that goes to the monitoring part of my other question is, mm -hmm. how do you monitor uh, the uh, uh, system available from business perspective? Thanks. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have written down a, uh, a component that actually queries uh, a, a kind of a, a component that goes and queries the health of each microservice. And we have a small kind of uh, um, uh, an agent inside agent code inside each of the microservice which gives it all the relevant data so uh, uh, then again if it is something very general then you can use uh, no so uh, I have one point to add on that so it happens on two approaches so one it can happen internally as well so internally the health monitoring microservice can uh, ha so as Rahul talked there are some init files inside which uh, inside the microservice which provides the health information so this health monitoring microservice can talk to that uh, init file, can get information from that init file to know about the health of that particular microservice. And then what next it does is to export this health in, uh, the health monitoring microservice exports its data collection from inside to outside. And then outside there are tools which can be used for uh, the other health monitoring perspective. Yes, yeah, so, so like as we said, we kind of give you collective health. So I, I said uh, initially we have a couple of switches uh, that we go and monitor, and this is the back end. So we, we collect, and that's, I mean, that's very specific uh, to the deployment itself. But for, for our case, what we did, we exported all the data out of uh, the monitoring microservice and then club it with. Uh, with with all the uh, like uh, some external client uh, machine which is taking right. the data from internal from the switches we take the health and we just give it uh, collective health only yeah yeah thanks maybe a follow up on that so you sure. talked about separating out a microservice that does the right. talks reads and writes the data is it still valid to have two microservices say write the same data that's stored by another microservice or is that kind of a violation. Sorry, uh, uh, oh, yeah. can you just repeat the question? I yeah. Yeah. Even so, so say you have a set of data that mm -hmm. that two different microservices would mm -hmm. operate on, including writing them. Right. Is that a violation of microservice design, or is that okay? I don't uh, think that's a uh, violation of microservice design. I think that's uh, fairly pretty yeah. well, and that is one of the approaches that we have to take when we we're, we're kind of splitting the monolith. Right. But then, don't you have the issue of no, like, no? Uh, so there is a namespace kind of a concept. So each of the microservices will have their own namespace kind of a concept. So even if the couple of microservices are sharing the same resource, it will be isolated. Yeah. It, it will have its own context. Different microservices will have its own context on that. So Otherwise at you have a dependency on one interacting with the yeah. other. Right, right. right, right.
So that was one of the points that uh, actually helped us. So uh, when you start uh, designing your microservices ground up and you start with so many microservices, that sprawl will eventually go on and happen. Uh, that is one of the approaches, but then each of the microservices, the kind of data you're sending out is totally under your control. Uh, so you have to basically make sure that uh, it's a it's a distributed system and it will generate a lot of network tra traffic. So you have to while writing the code itself, you have to make sure you write it in a very optimized fashion. Yeah. Okay, I guess we're past the hour. Uh, if there are more questions, we can actually take it offline. So. Thanks, everyone, for your presence here. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.